welcome everyone. We still have a few that need to find their seats, but I want to get us started. Um, first off, I have to admit to being a liar. I told uh, a teacher that was having a group of students, I said, oh, you can just come up about five till you, the seating won't be an issue. Look at you all. Give yourselves a round of applause for being here tonight. Thank you. My name is Kelly Keller, and I'm the director for the Center for Faith Studies, and I really do want to welcome you warmly to Countryside this evening. Um, a couple of items of business, well, three, um, before we get going on introducing the speakers this evening. First, if you haven't found them already, bathrooms. Um, you go out these, these doors to your left, and then just around the corner are the restrooms. And you'll see this little gold sign that suddenly appears because now you know to look for it. Um, so that's the bathrooms. Also, cell phones. If you can turn those to silent or off, um, that would be fabulous right now. And then lastly, just so you don't um, forget, we do have cookies and coffee um, and refreshments afterwards, and we would welcome you to, um, and they are in the coffee house that we have off to uh, the left as you exit the um, sanctuary, and we warmly welcome you to stay and chat with each other and get to meet some of the amazing human beings that are here tonight with us. Okay. The Center for Faith Studies is a program of the uh, Countryside Community Church, and it uh, has classes, panels, book clubs, because this church is all about faithful inquisitiveness, um, and you cannot satiate the curiosity of a Countryside um, member. But we also um, have always opened our programs to the community. And the one that is most visible to the community is this one, our lecture series, of which tonight is a part. Um, and so we're, we're grateful to have you here. We are most grateful for this continuing partnership with the Institute for Holocaust Education. Yesterday, I was um, blessed to be with a woman that some of you may know, Rita Paskowitz. She's a beloved storyteller, and if you've met her, you remember meeting her. Um, and I was with her yesterday, and uh, the context was talking about working with older adults and the importance of storytelling. And she said, one of the greatest gifts you can ever give a person is to be a witness to their story. I think that's what we're doing tonight. I think we are blessed with two women this evening who are brave enough to share their story, all of it, the pain, the hurt, and their hope, which is sometimes the scariest thing to share of all. So I really am so grateful to the Institute for Holocaust Education for continuing to entrust us with such a precious gift. And I thank you all for being willing to take part in it as well. So if, without further ado, I'm going to allow the Executive Director for the Institute of Holocaust Education, Liz Feldstern, to introduce our speakers in the evening. Please welcome Liz. Thank you very much. I, firstly, I have to echo everything that Kelly said about how wonderful our partnership is. We have thoroughly enjoyed the quite a few years now that we've been partnering with the Center for Faith Studies, I am, and we look forward to many more years of partnering. I have known Agnes Schwartz and Magda Brown for several years now, and they never cease to amaze and inspire me. These two women, each in her own way, exude a strength and perseverance that most of us, thankfully, will never be called upon to demonstrate. While the Holocaust is sometimes thought of as one large history, it's actually comprised of millions of individual experiences. Those of the nine million Jews living in Europe prior to World War II, those of the millions of other individuals targeted by the Nazis for being disabled, Roma, Slavic, communist, Jehovah's Witnesses, or gay, the complex history of the Holocaust also includes the experiences of perpetrators, of bystanders, standards, and of an unfortunately too few rescuers. 
Tonight, you will hear about the experiences of Agnes and Magda, two women who not only survived the Nazi onslaught, but have since dedicated their time and energies to sharing their stories and teaching all of us that when prejudice and discrimination go unchallenged, all of humanity is diminished. A note on the format for this evening. I am Agnes is going to speak first, and then Magda, and then we'll open it up to questions for both of the speakers. One last thing before we begin, in addition to our two speakers, we have quite a number of Holocaust survivors that have joined us this evening, and I'd like to ask all of those individuals in the audience to please stand and be recognized. So if all the Holocaust survivors would stand for just a moment. And we also have with us at least one World War II liberator. And so I'd like to ask Roy and any other retired or active military that are with us to please stand and be recognized as well. And with that, I would like to invite Agnes up to take the podium. Thank you very much, Liz, and thank you so much for the Institute for Holocaust Education in Omaha. I can, as a survivor, I so appreciate their dedication to teach the Holocaust, because as time goes by, there are less and less survivors alive. And when I speak to children, I usually tell them that you're probably the last generation to hear a survivor. And a story is worth a thousand words until you talk to a survivor. I don't think you appreciate truly what happened. Magda and I come from the same country, different cities, our stories are like night and day. You would not believe that we were from the same place at the same time. I was born in 1933, the year Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. I was born to relatively well-to-do parents who wanted a child for many years and were very happy to get a little girl. And I had set up grandparents on my mother's side. I was the only grandchild in Europe. and. Uh, I had my, my mother had an older sister married, but childless, I was her baby too. She made, she was a wonderful seamstress and she made all my clothes and I, I had the most beautiful clothes in the world. Anyhow, um, I'm just telling you a little bit about the, my early childhood because then you have the values of comparing it to what happened later. Um, my mother was a working lady. My father and she operated a business where they sold yard goods to tailors who made custom-made suits. Uh, and uh, because of that, we had a living housekeeper. Her name was Julia. She was another mom to me. She took me to the playground and cleaned house and cooked delicious meals, and she was just part of the family. Um, I knew nothing about Nazism before I went to school. I went to school and we, even before the first day, uh, my mother started to impress upon me that I had to do well in school. Now, why? Because there was a law called numerous clauses whereby only 1% of a college class could be made up of, of Jews. If you weren't at the top of your class, you, it was impossible to get into a university. My mother had two more sisters who had, long before I had been born, immigrated to the United States, then they settled in Chicago. Her oldest sister was a physician, and I think mom would have liked me to walk in her footsteps. I started to go to school, and first of all, I came home the first day, and I said, there's a funny-looking flag on a building in the street where I walked to school, and I knew what the Hungarian flag looked like, but this didn't look like it. 
Well, it was my first acquaintance with the swastika. This was the, Hung the Hungarian Nazi, the Arrow Crosses headquarters, and thus the swastika hanging from their windows. I went to a Catholic school, and I kind of figured it out that one reason was probably the best education in the area, and the second, perhaps it was safer to send a Jewish child to a Catholic school than to an all-Jewish school. Because I went to a Catholic school, every morning we had a half an hour of the New Testament catechism, so I be became well-versed in that. And we had a teacher come in to teach the Jewish kids our religion a couple times a week. Obviously, there was no separation of church and state, as you know it, in the United States. I felt no anti-Semitism in grammar school. We were all treated alike. However, after school, the Jewish kids went their own way. We had our own friends, and the Catholic kids went their own way. And never did we play together after school. The school system in Budapest is such that first you go to school for, uh, for four years and then you graduate. And then depending on your grade, well, if your grades are good, you can go on to a gymnasium, which is an eight-year college preparatory school. And if your grades are so-so, then you go to a polgari. And that's another four years of school whereby you learn a trade so you can make a living. Now I graduate from the grammar school, and I go, and there's a list posted on the door of the school, and I remember tears of joy rolling down my mother's face because, yes, I made it into the gymnas gymnasium. And once again, I went to an all-girls school. Now it was the Jewish girls' gymnasium. And life was still pretty good. By this time, often during the night, the air raid sirens went off, the Allies were bombing, and we grabbed some warm clothes, and we, I lived in a three-story apartment building, and we all went to the basement, and the building shook, and people were scared, and uh, I think as a 10-year-old, I couldn't conceive the idea that a building could possibly be hit. But when the all-clear signal went off, and I went back upstairs, that I could, could uh, see flames shooting up in the sky and also uh, smoke filled the air. And then I went back to bed and my parents went back to bed and in the morning I got up, I went to school and they went to work and life went on like nothing had happened. This went on until March of 1944 when the Germans didn't fight their way across the border. They just marched their way across the border because Hungary and Germany were allies. And the Hungarian people, well, they accepted the Germans with open arms. Hungary was in a depression. They were promised more money. They were promised jobs. They were promised everything Hitler promised the Germans who fell behind him. And so most Hungarians who were not Jewish probably became Nazi supporters. There were a few who were not, who hit people, who saved lives, but most of them fell into the category of following the Nazi party. Within a matter of 45 days or so, all the Jews from the outlying areas of Hungary were deported, mostly to Auschwitz. Of course, as soon as they came in, I had to start wearing a yellow star, just like every other Jew, and regardless of your age, no matter how young you, how young you were, uh, yellow star, 10 centimeters in diameter, sewn so on, tightly enough that uh, you couldn't slip a pencil between the stitches, so that you couldn't just grab it and tear it off. My parents must have heard of atrocities in the outlying areas, and they decided that the grandma and grandpa who lived about an hour train ride from Budapest, they decided to, that it would, they would be better off in the big city because nothing like that could happen in the big city. And my father especially put all his hopes in President Roosevelt, and President Roosevelt was going to save the Jews of Budapest. The war was almost over by the time the Germans occupied Hungary. They occupied Hungary in March, 
and the following, uh, well, where I lived, it was January, we were freed. So they had a lot of dirty work to do within a very short time. And they did it well. So now Grandma and Grandpa live with us, and I had to stop going to Stuart school. My father lost his business. And uh, by June, we had to move out of our nice apartment and move into what they called a Jewish designated or a yellow star building. They both mean the same thing. That was a big yellow star on the door, and they were try to, trying to concentrate the Jews together in a closer proximity. And uh, there went my nice clean apartment, and we moved in with two ladies, and grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad, and I in one room, and an elderly woman, as I remember, and her middle-aged daughter in the other room. Uh, the worst thing as a child I remember about this apartment were the bed bugs. I never even heard of a bed bugs until then, and after the first night I got up scratching and itching, and it was horrible. It was repeated every night. And these ladies figured out that, uh, well, the bathtubs had to be filled with water all the time by law. Probably in case of bombing, there should be water available. And these two ladies during the night would go and shake their nighties into the bathtub. And I woke up to this blanket of floating bed bugs and a very unappetizing sight. My mom was never a cook. She was always a businesswoman. But grandma was there, and grandmas are good cooks. So as far as shopping was concerned, first of all, people had been out of work for several months by now, and money was running scarce. And even if you had the money, well, you were only allowed to go shopping late in the afternoon. And by that time, the shelves were pretty bare. But Grandma made do with whatever that she could find, and uh, we weren't starving. And then my grandfather got sick, and so sick that we couldn't keep him at home. And we took him to a hospital. All of us went. And the hospital, well, the way I remember it was, it was like MASH or some of the old wartime movies you've seen with cats lined up one next to the other. And that's the last time I ever saw my grandfather and whether he died of neglect, of, hun of hunger, of natural causes, or they killed him to this day, I don't know. But I still had grandma and my parents. And I was very lucky. I was one of the very lucky ones because uh, I was always with somebody who I knew would take care of me. Other children were turn away from their parents and I can't even imagine the horror, the terror they must have felt before they were murdered. And they were murdered. So, um, we go on living in this apartment until a troop of Nazi officers march in, and a gunshot, gunshot rings out into the air, and uh, they order men, 18 to uh, 45 working age men, uh, to line up downstairs. Now we're in November 1944. The uh, Budapest winters are cold, like your winters in Omaha and my winters in Chicago. And uh, my dad put on his heavy coat and boots and a little knapsack. And the, one of the biggest lies the Germans told everybody was that they, they're taking these people to work. And that way the families didn't get quite as alarmed as if they knew where they were really going to the death camps. And uh, my dad said goodbye to us, I'll see you soon. And off he went. A few days go by, and the same scenario takes place. Once again, the gunshot rings out, and now, this time, it's my mother. I can picture her like it was yesterday in her gray Persian lamb coat, standing in front of me, trying his, her best to put a smile on her face uh, for my sake, and said, 
just like you would have uh, say to you if you had small children, just like you would say to them, I'm going away for a weekend, let's say, and stay with Grandma, and I'll see you soon. I'm, by this time, I'm 11, and that's the last time I ever saw my mother. I still had Grandma. I still wasn't alone. A few days go by and there's a knock at the door, and when there's a knock at the door, you jump to attention because it's probably the Nazis and what do they want now? And to our surprise, it was my father. And he told the story that he was in a cattle car and not knowing where he was going, like nobody knew where they were going. And a couple of German officers needed directions to Budapest. And that was his lucky day because he spoke a fluent German and that's what saved his life. He um, became their guide. They brought him back to Budapest, and uh, they could have shot him, but they didn't. They let him go. So he comes home, and of course he looks for my mother, and uh, we tell him the story, and immediately he says, I'm going to go after her. They're collecting the people at the brickyard, and I know where they're at, and well, they always collected the people of the brickyard because all the brickyards were located on the railroad and that facilitated the deportations. And I, as a little girl, tucked at him and said, Daddy, Daddy, don't leave me. Stay with me. Mommy's not here. Please stay with me. And even my grandma said to him, there's nothing you can do for her. There's no point in you going. So my daddy didn't go. And once again, there's a knock at the door, and now it's Julia, the lady who raised me, our housekeeper, or my nanny. And I don't know if this was prearranged between her and my parents, or she just took, up, took it upon herself and realized that it was time to try to do something for me. All I can tell you is that she saved my life by taking me home with her. Grandma threw a few articles of clothing in a brown paper bag. And uh, with that, I got on the streetcar with her, and she explained to me, well, first of all, my Catholic school background now came in handy because I knew something about the New Testament, should anybody ask me. And then well, the one thing I didn't learn in Catholic school was the rosary, and she taught that to me very quickly because every child of Catholic descent should know the rosary. And then uh, she told me that, well, we took off the yellow star, of course, and uh, what we're going to tell the neighbors was that the Russians were already occupying Eastern Hungary, and my parents sent me ahead to my aunt to try to get me away from the Russian occupation. And I took her last name. Nobody ever asked me any questions. Um, she also warned me that her neighbor was a big Nazi sympathizer. I had to be very careful what I said. It's a pretty heavy burden on an 11-year-old to know that you can't cry and say, I want to go home to my mom and dad, or even laugh out too loud and loud because you can't do anything to bring any attention to yourself. Well, Julia had potatoes and beans and smoked meats in her house, so once again, we didn't starve. There were no deluxe dinners, but there was always something to eat. And then the bombings became so frequent. This is a five-story apartment building. Everybody moves to the basement. There's a stack of wood piled up probably for firewood. Uh, there's no heat in the basement. It's now December, and it's cold down there, and it's damp down there, and uh, it's dark down there because there's no electricity. We live by candlelight. But above all, it was very stinky down there because there were no toilet facilities, and you have a couple hundred people down there. And a bucket is passed around, and the waste is thrown out discarded during the dark of night. We all lay one next to the other on this make-believe beds. We took blankets and pillows to make it more comfortable. And in between bombings, Julia would run upstairs and grab some food and bring it down. 
And we lived like that for a couple of months. And by that time, our question became what's going to kill us first, the Nazis or the bombs? Living through the war was, had, had become just out of the question already. And as we were most despondent, all of a sudden the bombing slowed down and then stopped and then uh, the machine gun fire abated. And news started traveling from building to building that there was guerrilla warfare in the streets and the Russians were occupying Budapest, thereby freeing the Jews. Well, we waited until we were sure and that we didn't hear any uh, explosions and then we stuck our heads out the basement. Now, you're in the dark basement for a couple months and now January and there's snow on the ground and the snow, sun reflects off the snow. And of course you're blinded until your eyes adjust, but I could smell as soon as I, they opened the door, I smelled and the only way to explain that smell that it was the smell of death. There were dead bodies all over the street. There were dead horses all over the street. People were running out with a carving knife to carve up the horses for a meal. But the war was over and we were alive. Part of Julia's building was bombed out. The other staircase was still there. And we went upstairs. And of course there is no electricity that's all bombed away and there are no telephones. Don't forget, this is a, the, the uh, 1940s, and everybody didn't have a cell phone, and even, uh, even a regular phone. You had to be privileged to have a... Very few people had a telephone in their apartments. We happen to have had one, but I think that was because my parents were in business, so they could call home. So all we could do was wait and hear what happened to the rest of the family. And one day I am playing in front of Julia's apartment and I look up and there's my father. My father, a handsome six-footer, very slimly built, and now he's skin and bones and he look, doesn't look healthy and I flew into his arms and, oh, he was one of the best things that could have happened to me. The sight of him was just, I was overwhelmed with emotion. Anyhow, he came into Julia's apartment and his story unfolded that he survived the war because he got papers from a Swedish diplomat called Raoul Wallenberg, who saved thousands of Budapest Jews by handing out papers. He bought a property in Budapest. And he said to the Germans, this is Swedish ground, I'm a Swedish diplomat, and you better not touch these people. And uh, after the war was over, Sweden was supposedly going to take those people. How my father got the papers to get into one of these homes, I have absolutely no idea. Some papers were real, some papers uh, were fake, but they worked. And as my father described that, there was very little food, and to quote him, there wasn't even enough room to stretch a leg. We were packed in so tightly. Well, slowly we moved back to our original apartment, and uh, there was a family living there. They were decent people because the stuff we had left behind was still there. And now what happened to the rest of the family? And slowly life took on some normalcy. My father got his business back and I started back to the Jewish gymnasium. And by this time, train loads of deportees are returning from the various camps and they're all sick and skin and bones. And they tell absolutely horrible stories. And we still don't know what happened to the rest of the family. Well, it appears that a couple of days after Julia took me, the Budapest ghetto was formed, and uh, the people from the Yellow Star houses were even more concentrated into the Budapest ghetto. Uh, there was a, <laughs> a big shortage of food, and of course, a lack of sanitation, and people were uh, dropping dead like flies. 
But this wasn't fast enough for the Hungarian Nazi parties. And they, they, were, they knew that the war was a matter of days or weeks, that it could come to an end, and they were going to kill as many Jews as possible. So they learned that they, they marched a troop group down to the shores of the Danube. They wired them together, and with one bullet, they could sink all of them to the bottom of the icy river. And that was the fate of my grandmother and my uncle and aunt, law-abiding Hungarian citizens. They were always Hungarian first and then Jews who never did anything wrong in their lives. Their only sin was having been born Jewish. So now we knew that that part of the family wasn't coming back. And I was very, very close to my grandparents. I spent a lot of time, especially in the summertime with them. And now we're waiting for my mother and then my father comes home crying one evening from the store and uh, sat me down and told me a lady came in uh, who was in Bergen-Belsen with my mom. And then my mom died on Friday, January the 13th, 1945, in her arms. Of so-called natural causes, which probably meant typhus and starvation. And I, as a little girl, wasn't going to believe that my mommy's not coming home to me, so I walked the streets and I looked for her and she wasn't coming home. My father contacted the American relatives, and way back around 1942, with the immigration process from my parents and myself started, and we got so far that we had all our papers, and um, our luggage was already in Lisbon. So because we, had, uh, we got our luggage back at that time, and that's how we got caught up in the Holocaust, but... Now the immigration process started all over again, and it was January 1947. And uh, my dad and I got on a propeller plane and flew across the Atlantic. And we were met in New York by my mother's younger sister's husband. Uh, he was a CPA, and my aunt was a housewife of the 40s, and mother and housekeeper, etc. and my father told me all kinds of stories on this airplane about everybody's so rich in America and people don't wash clothes, they just throw it out when it gets dirty. <laughs> and that I would be the princess because my cousins were all boys. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. I was the princess in Europe where I was the only child but in, the, in America. Anyhow... My mother's oldest sister, as I told you before, was a physician, so was her husband. They heard my father coughing. He had tuberculosis. He was sent off to Winfield Sanitarium, and uh, he was there for almost a year. They started me in school. I went in the third grade because of the language problem and kept moving up the ladder throughout the year, and within... Well, six months after, one semester after I would have graduated had, by, had I been born here, I knew enough English to graduate and make a little speech on the podium and go on to high school. And by that time, my father was well enough to be released from Winfield Sanitarium. And now I thought my dad is coming home to me and is going to make a home for me. And I was so happy because I never really assimilated in this family that I lived with. And they told me they loved me, but you know, the family who loved me from the time I was born was gone. And why should I believe that they love me? That they don't know me. They're strangers to me. And children think that those who died, died so that you did something wrong, that they perished. They just don't... I mean, I certainly didn't understand the realities of life. Anyhow, at this point, my dad says he wants to go back to Hungary. And that was the last blow for me. And my uncle, God bless him, and I kissed the ground every day in this United States, 
Because he said to my father, I'll pay your way back if you insist on going back, but no way will I pay for the child to go back to that terrible country. And so at age 14, now I lost my father too. And I grew up with this family and they did everything in their power to make me feel comfortable. But this was a family, an established family with two children and I never, I never felt like I, I fit. I always felt I was doing something wrong. And the princess now was asked to wash the dishes and throw out the garbage, just like I asked of my own children. But you know, that's not what my daddy promised me. And uh, as a teenager, I was uh, extremely, extremely lonely, and I had many girlfriends. My, my, uh, my friends started dating. Oh, well, I started to overeat, and, and I, they kept putting, putting me on a diet, and that's the last thing I needed after I lost everybody that I loved. And they also told me that nobody would love me because I'm too fat. Well, so I, believe, I truly believe that nobody would ever love me because uh, everybody I loved had died or left me. And... The boys I, lived, uh, I grew up with went off to college. I don't think my uncle figured on sending me to college. He wanted me to go to work in an office. That's about the last thing I wanted to do. I decided that if I went to nursing school, I could live away from home where I was so unhappy and, uh, and learn something. And I even got a scholarship to Mount Sinai Hospital in Chicago. Well, when I was a senior in high school, I met a young man who was four years older than I was, and, and he liked me. There was a boy who liked me. <laughs> and he came more and more often to our house. And within six weeks, he professed his love for me, and he asked me to marry him. There go on my education. But it was so important to me at that time to be number one once again in somebody's life. And I truly loved him and he loved me. Uh, and I got a, an engagement ring for my 18th birthday and following October we got married. The marriage brought about three children was probably some of the happiest times of my life when I had a loving husband and three little kids around me. And I can't go into detail because I don't have the time, but after 13 years of marriage, my husband got sick and so sick that we couldn't live with him and I got a divorce. I, um, there was a high school graduate with not, nothing no profession, and the Jewish Federation was kind enough to send me to school. They wanted to send me to four years of college, and I said, I don't have time, I have to make a living. So then within, I, they went, I went to business college, then that gave me enough to be able to go to work and make a living, and I was divorced, and I ended up raising my three children by myself, and those were some very, very difficult years. But they're all grown up and they've given me four grandchildren and I even have four great-grandchildren and my youngest grandchild is going to graduate next year. She's the last one to finish grad school and she's going to be a physical therapist. And I'm so very proud of all of them. And I've written my memoir and they will be available as you leave if you're interesting. They're called The Roll of the Dice, which is a line from my memoir that says that life was nothing more than a roll of the dice. And I thank you so much for being such a great audience, and I thank you for your interest in the Holocaust. And I speak here not because I enjoy recalling the past, but I know that I'm of the generation, the last generation, to be able to tell our stories. And I feel it is incumbent upon me that if people want to listen, I tell my story and see what happened. 
so that you can pass it on to your families and your children and know it don't let anybody ever deny it happened because today you met somebody. My scars are not physical. My scars are emotional. And let me tell you, they're still there. I still have nightmares. I still hide my children in my dreams from the Nazis. So please don't ever let anybody deny that the Holocaust happened. And now you're going to hear a very different version of another Hungarian survivor. And thank you very much. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you all for caring. Good evening. It's a hard act to follow. But my story, despite the fact that I was born and raised in Hungary, is totally different. I was born and raised in Hungary, lived in a very l beautiful, loving, religious family, and my childhood was the same as any of our children in this country. Happy-go-lucky. Sometimes I tell the students I would do my homework, I wouldn't do my homework, and you know, I hung out with kids, all the fun things that a teenager should do. Matter of fact, I have a show and tell, and this is my photo at 8th eight, eight, grade graduation to prove it to you that I also had two eyes and two ears and maybe the fashion was different then. But it's all just to substantiate the fact that I wasn't any different. So what happens when a happy-go-lucky child's life turns completely upside down? And how did it all happen? All of you are familiar with the onset of the rise of Hitler in 1933 in Germany. His major desire was to have a perfect race and space and slaves. And he pretty nearly accomplished his goal. So when he comes to power, he starts enacting all these desires and he calls it the final solution because his ultimate desire was to eliminate the Jewish race and many, many others, as uh, Liz had mentioned earlier, who were not Jewish, but he did not like. So, what is happening in Germany, they start creating anti-Jewish laws, which was called the Nuremberg Laws. And another thing that the Nazis have done during this era, there were two units of soldiers. There was one unit of soldier who was fighting on the fields. And then there was another unit of soldiers, which was called the Einsatzengruppe. These men were trained how to finalize the final solution. They were very well trained. So how did that all play out? In 1939, the Second World War breaks out, and they start occupying many of the Eastern European countries. So let's pick a country as large as Poland. Poland had a large population as well as a large Jewish population. So the regular fighting soldiers occupy the country. But the special unit's job is to go into the Jewish home, move the people out of their home into a ghetto, from a ghetto to a concentration camp, and thus the killing machine begins. Therefore, I call the Holocaust a premeditated, scientifically coordinated mass murder. Now I switched my thinking, my talk, into Hungary. I am living in Hungary, and as Agnes mentioned, Hungary is an ally of the Germans, so the German army stays out of Hungary for a period of time. But don't entertain the idea that our life was perfect. Certainly, a thousandfold better than our fellow Jews who were dying day after day by the thousands, because up to a point, we were still living in our own home. Up to a point, we were still going to school. Up to a point, we still had a job. But what the Hungarian government has done, they have adopted all the Nuremberg laws that was created in Germany. And now, let me give you 
two or three of them. There were many, many, many more. So let's start with number one, the military. Until about 1940, all young men, regardless of their religious background, would enter the military service when it was time to do that. Matter of fact, my father was a dedicated soldier of the First World War. And he was a very proud Hungarian, serving his country and fighting for his country. And he would show us as children his medals, etc. So now in 1940, the government decides that the Jewish young men could no longer wear the country's uniform, nor bear arms. However, he still had to enter the military compound, and they called it the Jewish Labor Force. That was their slogan, their, core, their uh, name. So now, what has happened in my family, my brother, in about 1942, he was just about military age, and my, father, my parents had to outfit him with civilian clothing, just like when we send our children to overnight camp. And my brother leaves home, enters this military compound. The Jewish boys are put in a separate unit, and they are, in a sense, already imprisoned, because where the regular soldier is allowed to go on a break or pass, you know, visit friends or whatever the reason, those boys had to have a very, very valid reason to exit the compound. And the other tragedy was that these Jewish men were treated both physically and mentally the most brutal way by the military. Next to anti-Jewish law. The professor, the uh, journalists, pharmacists, attorneys, first they were restricted from belonging to any of their professional organizations. But then, after a little while later, they got the pink slip. So from one day to the next, they were out of a job. Now you have to think differently here a little bit. There was no such a thing as a welfare system. So the Jewish communities had to pull their resources to support thousands and thousands of unemployed people and their families. And there were many, many, many laws that was just reducing us one by one by one. And this is the reason that I tell this story so explicitly, to make you understand that genocide does not happen from one minute to the next. It builds gradually. There are many signs that will indicate that things are going the wrong way. And it is your job, especially the children of the future, to protect our freedom and watch out for all these impending signs. So these anti-Jewish laws are continuing, reducing our livelihood, reducing our freedom. It just goes down all the way till you are, you are reduced to lower level than an animal. So, as Agnes mentioned, March 19, 1944, the Nazis enter Hungary. They walk into Hungary. They are greeted and welcomed by their fellow uh, allies. So like I mentioned earlier, the two units come in. Now the the, the, the Einsatzengruppe unit, the ones who are dealing with the final solution, have another plus in their favor. Adolf Eichmann is the leader of this unit. And Adolf Eichmann was the most experienced Jew killer on this earth. He had ample practice for 10 or some years to negotiate all these steps. Therefore, in Hungary, in 51 days, they are able to take you out of your home and ship you to your death. So how does that work out? When the first uh, uh, order is to wear the yellow star, and as Agnes explained that. So that is something uh, already painful. Next, we are in the, in the in, uh, I mean, the Nazis are in for this limited time, maybe 10 days. We get an order. All the Jewish people will be incarcerated into a ghetto. And to the children, I always run a comparison, what we understand in the English language, a ghetto is a where ethnic people decides to reside, 
But thank God they have total freedom to pick up and move somewhere else. But in real life, a ghetto is something totally different. So, now the government decides that in a big city, a section will be allocated to become the ghetto. And all the people in the outlying areas within the county are, to, uh, are collected by an umbrella group of the police called the gendarme. These are the most brutal beings. I don't even give them the courtesy of human, because I fully understand that when a soldier, a soldier has to obey his orders, but when that soldier obeys his orders 200% more than what is expected of him, that's sheer brutality. And these gendarmes practice that in, with full strength. So, here it how it plays out. The people in the outlying areas get the order that in one hour's time, they have to pack in a little overnight bag or a little uh, brown bag or something, a three, four days supply, provision, and then they have to line up on the street to be taken to the ghetto. Now sometimes the distance could be uh, uh, two miles, three miles, whatever. On foot, these gendarmes are pushing the people, shoving them, cursing at them. And by the way, there is no such a luxury as a carpool or bus ride or train ride. On foot, the babies, old people, they have to march through different locations to arrive to the ghetto area. I happen to be born in the area where to become, that will become the ghetto. So I lived in a house that my grandfather built maybe 40 years before that. It was a very comfortable home for six of us, my brother and I, my parents, and an aunt and uncle who lived with us. So now this gendarme comes with the group of uh, people into the ghetto area and looks into my house and makes an executive decision and shoves in a bunch of people. You see, human courtesy have died. Because what if in the other section of town my grandma lived or an aunt or a little relative? They didn't care. Just a group of people. So ladies and gentlemen, my home became the residency for 40 people. You cannot fathom what crowded condition can be. These people are exhausted. They are in shock, and now what my parents have done, once they knew that the people will be occupying our home, before, days before they moved the heavy pieces of furniture into the courtyard so that at least they can sit on the ground. Now comes me, the spoiled brat. Because I was the youngest child in the family, and I don't have to elaborate on it, I was spoiled. Which translates to, I had my own room and I had my own stuff. And this is where I learned to share. Because I had a, a closet full of clothes, etc., etc. And there were some young girls my age, and they had nothing, they had a little bag of stuff, so they could have that, so it, it was nice. Now the people who came to live at my home was a tad luckier than the others in the ghetto because my father was in the meat market business and in Europe it was customary to smoke the meat so it does not require refrigeration uh, at all. So we had a lot of smoked meat in our attic. So we could supplement the very meager rations that we were getting to eat. Once all the people were moved into the ghetto area, they were no longer out. It was fenced off, guarded, and we could no longer go to a doctor or, or a pharmacy or any of the very, very important things. We were locked in. I am going to tell you only two points to make you understand life in the ghetto. I call one the legal robbery and the other one the illegal robbery. Let's go with the illegal one. The Hungarian Nazi party was largely comprised by a bunch of young, uneducated hoodlums. These people were paid off, riled up to hurt the Jew, rob the Jew, kill the Jew, and they were very obedient. So, these punks would come into the ghetto, and remember, this was an established area from years back. The homes were filled with valuables, 
they would walk into a house, let's say they saw a painting, or, or a carpet, or a silver tray, any of value. Pick it up and walk out with it. Now, I'm not telling you this to tell you what they rob, because they rob everything from us. To make you understand that, un that the, until this time, the police protected me as well as any other citizen if a robbery would occur. This time, the police looks the other way. On to the legal robbery. We are in the ghetto for a limited time, and the order comes from the government that we have to turn over all our cash, our radios, our jewelry, and other valuables. And we were too much afraid to even think of not obeying. So here again, I am not talking about the, the stuff. I want you to understand that the money they took from us paid the Hungarian railroad worker to ship us to our death. We are in the ghetto for a limited time, maybe five, six weeks, and the order comes. The ghetto will be evacuated, and we are going to be taken to another country because they need laborers. So now we think to ourselves, okay, remember this is already the end of May, and the war has been going on for over five years, so we are hoping that the war will be over, we'll go and help wherever our labor is needed, we'll be over, we come home, life will continue. Unfortunately, it does not play out that way. And here came the, the classic lie of the 20th century. The families will stay together. Now think about it. We don't have any material things anymore. We have nothing. The only thing we have is our family. So what does that mean? We don't resist. We walk like the sheep to the gallows. So now the entire ghetto is evacuated and on foot we march to the other end of town to a brickyard. And we start wondering why in heaven's name did they take us to the brickyard when there's absolutely nothing except bricks. There's no furniture, there's no roof over your head, there's no toiletries, nothing. Aha. Uh -huh. But even that was scientifically figured out. Because on my 17th birthday, they put us into the boxcars. And I have a picture, which is, you can see at the Illinois Hung uh, Holocaust Museum, uh, where they got the original uh, boxcar. So, you see, they figured out the, the cars, the boxcars are adjacent to the railroad, to the, the, the railroad track is adjacent to the brickyard, and that was a perfect location to get us out of there. So now, if you ever have a chance to see the interior of a boxcar, it's maybe from there to here, and about this, this wide, so you would figure maybe 30, 35 people could sit on the ground, uh, okay. Ah, but that didn't work out that way. They shoved in as many as 80 to 85 people. There was literally standing room only. You would just shift one way or the other way. In order to allow my parents to sit on the wooden floor, I stood shifting one inch this way or that way for three solid days. Once they slammed the door on us, in the corner were two buckets, one for toilet use, and one bucket had, uh, was filled with water, except that water was never, ever refilled. So ladies and gentlemen, besides emotional stress and physical pain, the absolute worst thing is thirst. You should never, nobody on this earth should experience what thirst really is. Because they never refill those water, bottle, water container. And what happens after a while, you are so thirsty, you forget about your physical pain. You forget about where you are. The only thing you can concentrate on, if I could only have a slip of water. Your mouth is dry. Your lips are parched. And... And there are many issues within the boxcar. There are every personality present there. 
There is the quiet one. There is the one who is cursing, the one who is praying. There is everything. Crying. Any, any emotions that you have studied in psychology 101, it was there. And the only one other thing I want to mention about the boxcar is that in the corner was a young woman with a baby on her bosom, but unfortunately, that, or maybe fortunately, the baby died on her bosom rather than suffering another way of dying. So now we have no idea where we're going. On the third day, the train stops, open the doors, and some strange looking men in striped uniform come aboard, and we don't even understand what, what language they're speaking, but somehow or another your senses understand the sign language. What they were trying to say, the little bit of belongings you brought from home, leave it in the boxcar, you'll get it later. Later never comes. It's collected by a different crew of people once we are emptied out of the train, and that unit sorts out the stuff, and if they find some valuables in there, it goes to the fatherland, etc. So now, we exited the train. The men are directed to go in that direction, and that's the last time I see my dear father and any of the male relatives who came with us. Now, we have a sea of people on this ramp. But you see, you have to do your mathematics. It would not be feasible to send one train of people on a long, uh, uh, on a long journey. So depending on the size of the individual community, they couple together as maybe as 50 or 55 of these train loads. So when we arrive, there are several thousand people. Matter of fact, post-war statistics indicate that Hungary exited 147 of these train uh, transports in 51 days, equaling uh, uh, close to a half a million people. So, now we are marching forward, and uh, all of a sudden, a group of Nazi officers are facing us, and they do like this, which translates to stop. You see, we are no longer people. We don't have a name. We just are like the zombies. Do this. Move this way. The ordering around continuously. So now, one Nazi officer steps forward, points a finger at you. So, you go this way. And my beautiful young-looking mother, who was holding on to me, is directed that way. And I'll get back to that away later. Matter of fact, I'm moving. As I'm moving, I tell her, I see you later, mother. Unfortunately, later never comes. So now comes a succession of expediency. Next room, a giant room, disrobe completely. Lay down your clothes on the floor, and then you'll get a shower, you'll get the last stitch of clothes from home later. Forget it. Nothing. Now we are start naked into another room. Now remember, I'm 17 years old. What is the most important thing for a young girl at age 17? To fix her hair. And now in this room, they are, they are shaving our hair bald, and all our body hair are shaven. And if that's not bad enough, they spray disinfectants on our freshly shaven skin. The girls were screaming so loud that it could shake the building because of, of the shock and the total picture. It, it was a horrible experience. From here, we went into another room which was called the shower. Well, don't entertain the idea that the shower came anywhere close to where you took a shower at home. This was nothing more than an empty room with about 50 shower heads screwed into the ceiling and literally a trickle of water was reaching your dirty, smelly body. No soap, no towel, no clean underwear. Next room. Now we go into this room that has a mountain of clothing. I mean to the ceiling. A person behind it, don't even look at you, just throws a garment at you. They don't look at you, are you short, tall, fat, skinny, whatever, zero. I ended up with a long slip. And for shoes, they took that away too. 
They gave us flip-flops that has wooden sole. It's the most horrible thing to walk in because it has a leather band across it and it rubs against your foot and it's bad. So now it's time to go to sleep. They put us into a totally empty room because if you have seen Auschwitz photographs, you can see the prisoners like sitting on a bunk bed idea. But this was a totally empty room because the Hungarian Jews were taken to Auschwitz number two called Birkenau. And Birkenau was the location where they had the crematoriums. So about two years prior to our arrival, they leveled off about five or six Polish villages surrounding the area. So when the next transports come, they built additional railroad tracks from the arrival spot of Auschwitz proper directly into the Birkenau uh, crematorium section. So when we were separated, the people would shove back in the train and they would ship the ride direct to the area where the crematorium was. So now we are in the, so that's why Birkenau was nothing more than a transitory camp to, uh, to be, for us to be killed. So that's why they didn't bother with any bunk beds or nothing. Now the room would have held, held maybe 200 people lying down on the floor. But we got to be a unit of 500. So f to, in order for us to lay on the flat floor, 500, they laid us down like the sardines in the can. So then the, the amount would fill. And to this, to this day, I can't figure out something. Uh, we were not permitted to go outdoors during the night to use the latrines, which is the toilet, but it was a latrine. A latrine is nothing more than a giant hole that was dug in the ground, a wooden plank across it, some circles to sit down. And during the night, they didn't allow us to go out for that service, but they put two buckets in our corner of the room, and you can imagine 500 people, it was not a happy sight. So now, we are sleeping, a crack of dawn, four o'clock in the morning, we are awakened, out. As we wore in the crimpled clothes, there's no such a thing as brush your teeth or wash your face or any of the normalcies of life. Out we go, and now we are the unit of 500, and they have an older prisoner who is designated to be our so-called supervisor. And her job is to get us out into the courtyard, and there comes another painful situation. It is called the counting. You had to stand five abreast, and this supervisor would count you, one, two, three, four, five. This counting insanity could take an hour, two hours, two times a day, three times a day. Why? Where in heaven's name could he have gone to? Number one, every couple of yards we had a woman, Nazi woman guard with a police dog. Every couple of yards there were watchtowers with a machine gun, a soldier aiming a machine gun at us. And if that's not enough, the entire camp was surrounded by electrified barbed wire fence, but they kept counting us. Food, I don't even want to bring that up because it was, green, horrible smelling liquid with some stuff floating in it, unrecognizable. Matter of fact, the first day when we got there, we were gagging on it, and some of the old timers gathered around us and said, give it to us. And we did, but little did we realize that we better don't do that again because that's the only food we're gonna have to sustain us. In total, if our total calorie a day was perhaps 400 calories, maybe 500. So, these were the days, and there's one more thing I want to mention about Auschwitz, and that is, when we were there for about a couple of days, the old timers were, uh, we were asking the old timers, could you tell us how soon we're gonna see our relatives who went that away? Inevitably, they raised their arm, they pointed to the five chimneys. See, we kept seeing the chimneys spewing out very heavy black smoke, 
and it had a burning smell that was like when you kill a chicken and you have put it over a fire to burn off the feather. It was that smell, but we could not, who had time to analyze what that is? And they said, that's where your parents are. We absolutely refused to believe what they were saying. Unfortunately, later we realized the reality of it. So all our poor darlings who were taken that away, they, they used so much trickery, it's unbelievable. The way they made them comfortable, even they had an undressing room with a, 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 a hook on the wall <clears throat> and had numbers on it. And they would tell them, get undressed here and remember the number where you hung your clothes so you can find it afterwards. Unfortunately, it doesn't turn out that way. So that's why whenever a denier comes up from the woodworks, that the crematorium was an imagination, it was unfortunately very, very true. So this was the very limited overview of Auschwitz life. But then came the other situation that called the selection. The selection meant that, let's say my unit of 500, were ordered to go out into the courtyard and this rope halfway. And I guarantee you, they were not looking for our sexual beauty. They were looking how strong your upper arm was and they were selecting the stronger person to be shipped out of the country. So a thousand of us Hungarian women were selected to be shipped out of Auschwitz. Therefore, I do not have a tattoo because they were anxious, number one, to kill us first in Birkenau. Second, they were anxious to get it out, out of Auschwitz. So now the thousand of us were put on the train and we ended up in um, Stadt Allendorf, which is the vicinity of Marburg, Kassel, Frankfurt area in Germany. In a, and our job was to work in an ammunition factory that manufactured rockets and, and uh, bombs. So, now most of us thousand girls were teenagers or just out of school or young, young women. We have never seen a factory, let alone work in a factory, but you'd be surprised when they force you to do things, how fast you learn the most menial work on, on earth. So what was our job? First of all, we had to march to the factory. And here I tell you something that I bet you have never heard in any of your Holocaust books or any of, anything about the subject. What has happened in the, when we marched to the camp, to the factory, I'm sorry, we marched underground because the factory was built with a flat roof, sodded, trees growing out of it, and when the Allied reconnaissance trains were searching the area, they saw nothing more than a nice meadow. But we were right there. So now, our job was to fill the bombs with highly poisonous liquid material. And we did it. It was in front of your workbench. You, there were pipes coming through, and we would fill these bombs and lock it. And then two people had to lift it to carry it to a warehouse location. And we were doing this 12 hours a day, one week during the day, one week at night. It was a, a bad routine, or hard, hard work. And we were housed in an old deserted army barrack. So our living conditions were a tad better than in Auschwitz because now we had a bunk bed, we had some straw to sleep on, and they gave us an itchy horse blanket. So anyhow, one time I am sitting on the, on the edge of the bed, and I had, we were 16 of us in one room, and I started crying, and I'm not a crying personality. And my roommates asked me, why are you crying? What's the matter with you? I said, I am so hungry that I can't see straight. I want you to know that, you know, we always saved a little bit of bread in case we don't get any breakfast. So we saved something from the supper pizza bread. They grabbed their little crust of bread and they shared it with me. And that is 
the true sharing of caring for one another. So, after a couple of months, we are working at this factory. Now our hair starts growing out into crew cut size, and we look at each other, and we don't quite look the way we looked before. Some of our hairs turned orange, our face lemon yellow, and our lips became deep dark purple. What has taken place? We were working with this highly poisonous material without any protective garments, and it started invading our body. But thank God, the end was nearing. At the end of March, the director of the camp received an order from headquarters to put us on a death march towards Buchenwald, because that was the closest campsite, and in a very thin spring coat, on a wet, cold march, they put us on the highway. That's why I never want to be cold ever again either, because that was bad. And now on foot, we marched, and we had to protect our sick ones, because the punishment would have been too great. During the night, we slept in the ditches on the wet ground. And on the third day, we arrived to a farm area. And we have noticed that there aren't as many Nazi guards with us as when we started at the campsite. I guess they were trying to save their own lives, whatever. So now, we are standing in front of this farm a group of us, about 12 or whatever. And you see, we lived in faith and fantasy. So here it comes the fantasy. How would it be if during the night, one by one, we crawl and we reach that barn that was like maybe two blocks yonder, and we'll hide there? You see, the important thing here is we have totally lost our self-esteem. So what? They find us, they shoot us, it will be all over. But, thank God, the next day, two young men are walking towards us to this barn, and they wore a different uniform we were not familiar with, but it turned out to be two scouts from the 6th Armored Division of the U.S. Army, God bless them all, and they were our liberators. Thank you. very much. I forgot one more thing. Wait, wait. One more thing that I tell mostly for the young people in the audience. My closing remarks are to you, because you are our future. Protect your freedom in every possible way you can, because slavery is terrible. Second, I want you to think. Think very hard before you hate. I am not telling you to hate or not to hate. That is up to your conscience. But at least give it some thought. Thirdly, there are constantly people denying the existence of the Holocaust. So if anyone doubts what Agnes and I have and other survivors have been telling. Our famous General Eisenhower was one of the liberators with his unit of soldiers in a, an Ordorf camp, which was a pretty bad concentration camp. He was shocked, and he summoned his soldiers and told them, take as many photographs as you can, because the world will not believe it. So I'm reading you his quotation that will further understand how he felt. And here it goes. I have never felt able to describe my emotional reaction when I first came face to face with indisputable evidence of Nazi brutality and ruthless disregard of every shred of decency. I visited every nook and cranny of the camp because I felt it my duty to be in a position from then on to testify at first hand about these things, 
in case there ever grew up at home the belief or assumption that the stories of Nazi brutality were just propaganda. So keep that in mind. And now, if anyone has any questions, let's hope we can give you an answer. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Another uh, round of applause real quick for these women. We do have, we do have two microphones um, around for questions, but I do want, to, we have um, about 10 minutes for questions, so please ask a question and not a speech. May I interrupt? Yes. I experienced the easiest way to do it with the children, or with adults, no, I do it with you, <laughs> to just come up here, and I can answer you in split seconds, because by the time the microphone goes there and comes back, that minutes, seconds, time. So let's, up, up, up. Oh, There's the first brave one. No, she's not. No, I, I, <laughs> we've got a couple microphones. We're OK. Yeah. OK. Thanks. Two yep. questions. What mechanism did you use to survive? And what mechanisms did you use to forgive? <laughs> OK. You don't forget. I have long forgiven the perpetrators because I want to live in peace. So therefore, how can I promote to these children what I just said a minute ago, don't hate, if I continue hating? Now remember, when I was first liberated, I could not have made that remark to you because the pain was so acute. Now you asked me the other part of how did I keep going? Faith, courage, determination, and lots and lots of helpers. I thank every volunteer around the world because there are so many incidents in my life that came through the help of volunteers. And faith in God. I mean, there's no other way of doing it because I've been up and down even in my life afterwards where somehow I'm still here. Yeah. just curious I know you were surviving and all but I was always kind of curious about um, like your high holi holidays did you ever have that inside your heart you know during the high holidays yes or? and I'll tell you how that was in the camp we were as I told you earlier we were watched constantly but somehow a remarkable how a human brain can come up with ways of hiding the only hiding place we had was behind the latrines. They did not watch over us every second. So among them, among us rather, there were many very, very religious women. And they were older than the every 17 year old. And they, I don't know how, but they knew about religion. They knew, of, not religion, but they knew about holidays. And they would gather us youngsters and they would say the prayers with us. And they kept our faith going. But I mean, it was, it was an unbelievable experience. Question here. Uh, my question is, what happened to Julia? Julia. Okay, it's your turn. OK. Julia and I, well, first of all, my relationship with my father fell apart because, because I felt deserted by him. And he would write me, and I would write him less and less often. But uh, Julia and I corresponded, and uh, uh, I, then my father told me that she passed away. Now, in my memory, Julia appears to have been older than my parents. And by this time, I was grown, and I contacted uh, Yad Vashem in Israel. And I by this time, I truly appreciated how she risked her life to save mine, because at age uh, 11, I'm not sure if I was truly appreciative enough of that. And I wanted her, I wanted to plant a tree for her in the Avenue of the Righteous Christians, and they wanted proof, and there was no proof. So uh, finally, after two years, they accepted her, and then they wanted to send her family documentation she had no family. And perhaps that helped her give the courage to save my life because as a child asked me not long ago, would, if the shoe was on the other foot, would you have saved someone? And it takes a lot of thinking. You want to say right away, of course I would have. But if I had a family whose life I would have jeopardized, 
Would I have? Could I have? I don't have an answer to that. So Julia, since she was alone, I think that was one of the things that should gave her courage to save my life. And I was at, at Yad Vashem about five years ago, and then the emotions of the, <clears throat> of the whole thing really got to me, and I finally felt I was at her graveside, and I truly thanked her properly at that time. Mine, um, in terms of what's going on today, in terms of people being killed in Africa and the Mideast, et cetera, going on, what lessons do you think? What, what was the question? And, uh, in respect with what's going on right now, but uh, I didn't get the question at the end. I guess the gentleman is talking here. Oh. Ask it again. No, there was a. What, what perspectives or lessons should be learned from your experiences and what happened with what's going on today in terms of people being killed in Africa and the Middle East? And, and, it's very, very you know. scary. There is no excuse for genocide, and that's the only way to put it for people to kill each other just because there's a difference of religion or a different, uh, somebody looks different, that is preposterous. Uh, there are good and bad in every kind, and I usually tell the children, get to know people before you decide whether you, if you like them or you don't like them. And then if you don't like them, then you walk away. And we live in a very scary world today, and anti-Semitism in Europe is very much on the rise again. And I am very grateful that my children all grew up in the United States. And this may not be the perfect place, but it sure is the best place in the world. Thank you. Agnes, your story is my mother's story, but my mother grew up in occupied Norway as an 11-year-old Lutheran girl. Mm -hmm. And she describes to me an encounter that she had in a cafe waiting for a boat to go home of encountering an SS officer. And to this day, she says that is the most terrified she's ever been in her entire life. Which, and I'm, sometimes I struggle to try to understand that. But when you guys saw them, could you see any humanity in them? Because my mother couldn't. No, I can't see any humanity in, in, in any of it. All I can see is hate and... Uh, pre-planned murder, and they worked for years to plan the annihilation of the European Jews, and they almost succeeded. They almost succeeded. Uh, Budapest Jews, they killed half of them, and the outlying areas, a much larger percentage. Those well, who didn't... went to the camps, uh, a lot of, most of them well, didn't come. Back. I have a different opinion. I mean... Yes, brutality I described to you quite clearly, but there's humanity still comes forth in kindness. And let me tell you how that was. I was working in the factory, and we had old, old men, civilians as supervisors, because, you know, everybody was at war. And this little old man must have been about 70 years old, and when you are 17, a 70-year-old is Insurance. very old. <laughs> So, I spoke at that time fluent German, so I could talk with him. Do you know that he brought me several times a green apple? If you eat the best chocolate on earth, caviar, anything that is beyond normal to your palate, could not compare with that green apple because we haven't seen fruit or vegetables or anything for some time. So, may have not been many, okay, but at least there was one. So I give him the, the honor to remember him. Of course, Julia had the humanity. She hid me, she risked her life to save mine. So, yeah. So, you know, there's, there were just too few, or some were just too scared. 
Did you have any after effects from the chemicals that your body absorbed when you worked in the chemical? Uh, fortunately uh, not. And I'll tell you why. We were nearing the end, and as such, after we were liberated, our first thing to do was to eat. <laughs> Incessantly eat. A thick slice of bread, just a thick layer of butter on it, then honey over it. I won't tell you the abdominal effects, but <laughs> it, it, it wasn't, uh, it was an absolute necessity. So to answer your question, uh, we had proper nourishment as, as the liberation, after the liberation. And we were young, at God's help. I mean, I really, medically, I could not explain any other reasons, but uh, we are here. Now, there was one lady who died in our camp, and she's buried there. Matter of fact, when we went to Germany, visit the camp in uh, 1990, we visited her graveside. And uh, we really don't know of the origin of her death, but it can be very likely the possibility that she was affected by that problem. By the poison? Hmm? By the poison? I'm guessing. Now, yeah. this, I, 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 but it's a possibility. That's the only one that died from our group. Yes. One final question. Um, you advised us to think very hard before we hate, um, but then you also said that it has to be on our conscience to decide whether we hate or not. And then you made the statement that you had to forgive because you couldn't live. That that's how you decided to for how, to keep living. How how do you live in both of those states at the same time? It's not, it, 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 you have to make a conscious decision, decision which way to go. I'm going to give you a very brief comment of my personal experience. I spoke at a gathering, and afterwards, a young man approached me, and a non-Jewish young man, and he was asking me many questions, and very briefly he said, both my grandfathers were Nazi officers. Men of a fact, they served, and he told me camps and what have you. And he said, now they are in purgatory. And I don't know where he's going. So here it comes. He said, I, it was a church gathering and it was, you know, church meeting to follow my presentation. So he said, when I go back to the church and I look into the picture of Jesus Christ, I would very much like to see your face of forgiveness in that picture. It's not a simple little question to mm -hmm. answer. Well, God is in my corner all the time because he comes to my rescue. And I answered him. In the Jewish religion, our holiest of holidays, the Day of Atonement. We fast, we pray, and among our prayers, we ask God for forgiveness, for forgive our sins. And among them, there is another little prayer that says, forgive the sins of your perpetrators. If you have ever seen a relief on a child's face, it was worth the entire presentation where I, you know, just to see that. So, uh, and I told him, I said, I could not have told you this right after the tragedy. But as years pass, so that was my answer. So your faith is the thing that helps you to hate and forgive at the same time. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, may I answer that question too? Because my perspective is very different than Mac does. I have not forgiven them, and I don't think I ever will. Now, we've had some young people from Germany come and work at the Illinois Holocaust Museum, and I'm part of them, both of us are part of their speakers bureau. And those kids have impressed me so much. They're trying to, they, they dedicate a year of their life to uh, serve the Jewish community. And in essence, they're atoning for the sins of their elders. And some of them were quite open about knowing that their grandparents were Nazis and they can't understand how. And I've truly taken these young people to my heart because they were, they're, they're not the Nazi era people. But for many years, I had a very difficult time se uh, separating. I mean, to me, all Germans were Nazis. And it's not true. Today's generation are not Nazis, and uh, they're wonderful young people. But those who killed my family, no, I will never forgive. Uh -uh. But there is one other project that's going on that 
I'm just throwing it out. It's, you can Google it. It's called Germany colon close up. And this is yeah. between Jewish organizations and German groups, and they have exchanged uh, among young people. Matter of fact, two of my little friends, they are in their 20s, visited this program in Berlin last spring. And the German children, children, I mean in, you young, know, young adults. adults, greet these people, they take them to uh, Holocaust sites, they take them to important places. So they're interacting like people should. So there's a hope for a future along these Look, lines. Thank you. Isn't that interesting that today Germans are immigrate, I mean, uh, Russians are immigrating to Germany, Russian Jews are immigrating to Germany to feel safe. So the world has kind of come in a circle. Okay. Were they not wonderful? Please. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Very much. Please Thank you very take much. a moment to take in the mug here in this country. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you all for being here this evening. As I said before, we do have coffee and cookies. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little cold in here. Um, no uh, please uh, take part in that. Um, also, here are some cards. If you're interested in future CFS events, um, Center for Faith Studies events, you can, and you're not on our email list, you can fill out a card. And there are books for sale out in the foyer as well, and lots of wonderful people to meet. Thank you.